you might be wondering why this car is all disassembled because you saw in part one my previous video how we assembled it from a bare chassis as they would say in England up to a fully functioning car well the problem was when I bought the transmission for this car I thought it was fully gone through adjusted rebuilt it was not it was used and it had not been touched so when I put it in the car it had all kinds of problems I tried adjusting it to find the sweetest spot I could but it still was not able to handle first, fourth, or reverse without slipping badly. So it had to come out. I've got a rebuilt, adjusted replacement box. It's a little bit heavier duty. It may be overkill for the car, but at least I don't have to worry about that anymore. We had to pull the engine out. We pulled the transmission out, and the two are on the workbench. The other thing I have to do is I have to make an adapter plate that goes between the bell housing and the transmission because the whole pattern is different for this new slightly larger transmission so that's where we're at today so let's... but for the morbidly curious let's take a look at how we went from this to this let's do a quick overview before we tear this thing apart i deliberated whether or not i wanted to tear this apart during the summer or the fall or the winter and i decided winter was better because i'm not going to drive it when it's super cold outside and you'll see what it looks like now and then I'll give you a time lapse of me disassembling this thing. So we have a, a supercharger here that's going to come off. This cowl will first come off just using these two thumb screws. Cowl comes off and then you start removing linkages for the throttle and the fuel line, which you plug so it doesn't dribble all over your floor. And then there's a few bolts that hold the supercharger on and it slides off a spine shaft. So that'll go on a shelf for safe storage. And I always tape over the holes so nothing can get in like dust or, or rocks. Not that I have a lot of rocks in my shop, but you never know. It's always better to be safe than sorry because if you suck a rock through that supercharger, it gets expensive real fast. The radiator shell and the radiator behind it. And so that means we've got to drain all the fluids because that has to come out of the way. We have to release all the bolts for this headlight upright and find a place to store those. And then we get into the engine bay. Let's just flip that over there. And the bonnet comes open like that. In a British car, they call that the bonnet. It's not the hood because the hood would be a convertible top that goes over here. And it's not the trunk, it is the boot, because a trunk would literally be a large steamer trunk that you would bolt to the back of some of the bigger British cars. So looking at the engine, when the supercharger comes off, this whole pipe, this intake pipe has to come off. And I think it's better safe than sorry. We're going to pull the entire induction system off from the head because we don't want anything to happen to that when we crane this thing out of here. And then we have to think about everything else that's attached all these lines have to come off. If we forget a single one of them, they're ruined. And some of them are gauges that have like an alcohol solution that senses temperature for the radiator. If you break those lines, you're, you're buying a new gauge. And these gauges are made of unobtainium, so we don't want to break those. And then we have to think about other things. We have a starter motor here, so that means we have to disconnect the battery and disconnect all the, the cables associated with that. And then finally, once all that's loose and we're ready to pull the engine, we have the motor mounts on either side here. Those can come out and then the whole thing comes free. But we also have, before we do any of that, we have to pull this exhaust system off all the way back because there's no support. There's a little support in the intermediate, but it's much easier to start from the back and just pull things that direction because they slip over the things before them. You can see that all has to come out because there's no, you can't pull the engine with this whole thing hanging off the side. There's also a bunch of safety wires that hold heat shields. So we're just going to cut those. We'll remake those later. The rest of it is pretty easy because it's just held on by these springs and they're also safety wired so they don't come apart. But that allows this exhaust system to expand and grow as it heats up. It's just sitting in cradles and then the spring holds it to the cradle. So we just cut these safety wires, release the springs. This whole thing will come off. You can see the transmission. All the guts of it are right in this box here. And then it extends back a distance where it meets up with the propeller shaft to go to the rear axle. It's not easy to get to. And it's even not easier to adjust when you have to because you have to get in to here where you can look down at the adjusters. 
which means your body is all the way in this space. But we've done it before. Hopefully we don't have to do it with the new unit, but we need to get this thing out. And the interior of the car, we're going to remove the gear selector remote. We'll get the choke and the uh, idle speed control out of the way. We'll take up the floor and the seats and the transmission tunnel. And they're all bolted in. You can see there are screws and fasteners for everything here. The floors are not actually attached to the body. They're just, there's a foam rubber seal there with drain holes for rain. So once the seats are out, I can just undo these fasteners and the floors just lift right out. And then also the uh, transmission tunnel, which is bolted in in a few spots. This box reminds me of the final scene in Raiders of the Lost Ark where a highly prized object is contained within an anonymous box. However, it's okay to open this box. It's not gonna melt your face. This is the guest of honor. This is our new Wilson pre-selector gearbox. It's actually not brand new. It's, it's a rebuilt unit, probably from the 40s. I'll have to look up the serial number and see. Unlike a regular clutch-driven car, this car doesn't have a main pressure plate up front against the flywheel. It's, there's nothing. It's a straight shot from the crank to here. So all the clutching is done for each gear. And the reason that the race car drivers liked that so much is they didn't have to double clutch for smooth gear changes. So these pre-selector boxes were really nice because you could pre-select it and then four miles later when you hit that curve, you just press and release the gear change pedal, keep your hands on the wheel and it'll go into the next gear. They're wonderful to drive and this is really well suited for an old MG race car. So let's dig in. This car is not going to build itself, so we better get to work. So I think we're ready to start pulling linkages and then we can also pull these two connectors, I think they're made by Michelor. They're, they're basically like motorcycle exhaust clamps. We'll pull those off here so that we can slip this tube out. And if I remember right, those are metric. So we'll have to get our other set. And the nice thing is we can leave all this in place. The carb stays on, the, this manifold stays on. We don't have to worry about any of that. We just have to remember to get the fuel line and the throttle linkage and this will come right away. You're allowed to be comfortable when you do this. Okay, we have multiple linkages here, and the one I like to do is right there. There's a little mini cotter pin. I don't know if you can see that. Yeah, you can see that. There's a little cotter pin and a nut. All I have to do is take that pin out, pull the nut, pull this out, and set it aside. The rest of this can just stay where it's at. Okay, we need to remove the fuel line. There's a couple ways. We could do the banjo, but those can be notoriously hard to seat. And these are crush washers that aren't meant to be reused that many times. So why don't we instead remove this fitting here? Fairly loose there. And then we're gonna pull it straight out to get it off of the spine shaft. So, here goes nothing. We want to make sure we support it. You don't want to accidentally drop that carburetor. There she goes. Freedom. Let's take this to the workbench before something bad happens to it. Okay, now you can see the general layout how that supercharger mounts. It basically sandwiches between these brackets. There's the drive shaft. Still has my witness tape on it from when I was measuring it. And the spline looks good. Has grease on it. The universal joint looks really good. No problems there, no, no weird slop. The keyway is still intact. 
So that fix worked. This was a fix that we did before where we added this large diameter opening to make way for this. Originally, it was just a hole cut for a starter in this tube that was much smaller. It was only big enough to take this shaft, but we had to add a second universal joint in order to make up for engine twists and chassis twists because the engine's mounted to flexible mounts and the supercharger is rigid mounted. They don't move together. So we had to accommodate that and that fix seems to have worked. We'll drain fluids. That's our next step. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. With the interior and floor removed, we have access to the transmission mounts. You can see how this transmission is supported. There's a motor mount. This is an MGTD motor mount with a plate on either side with screws in it. So the bottom side mounts here and the top side mounts here. And then this adapter bolts to the transmission with some countersunk screws that go upward. The new transmission is big enough that the case is going to extend further this way. It's about three inches toward us longer and a little bit wider. So all these points are now going to be in the way, including some of this handbrake bracket. This bracket keeps this handbrake thing from flexing when you tighten the brake. So what we'll have to do is we'll put the new transmission in, we'll shim it up to height, and then we'll envision how we want these brackets to support it. And we'll just cut these back and modify them accordingly to get the right distance. We make it sound easy and hopefully it is easy. All right, the engine is out. We use these ratchet straps to control the angle of the dangle because with the engine in, we had to angle it this way in order to release it from the transmission. And then the transmission, we had to angle the front end down to clear this firewall and out the front. That's where we are at the moment. Let's go over and take a look at this transmission. So we've got some differences. This is the adapter for the bell housing that goes on previous gearbox like so and then the bell housing mounts to these studs completely different hole spacing so we're going to have to make one of these and it also needs to be thicker in order to get the correct offset because this shaft is longer so we've got some engineering to do here we are in the shop we have a little conundrum. This is the transmission that came out. I found out through other sources that this transmission should have in fact been plenty powerful for this car, but it's completely worn out. And the turnaround time to send it to the one guy in England that does this is too long. It's, I don't wanna have the car out of service for that long and the expense of shipping it back and forth, it's just gonna take the car out of service at least all summer. And we already have this freshly rebuilt and adjusted box here conundrum is we can't use this adapter plate for that box. So the purpose of this plate is it bolts on there and then this is pattern on the studs is for the bell housing. So the bell housing is this piece here and that goes over the end like so to make a complete transmission setup and that has the right bolt pattern for the engine. So we can reuse this but when we try to transfer this to here you can see these studs are completely different. So my guess is this is for a, 
probably a six cylinder MG triple M transmission. So we're going to leave this with this gearbox in the event that we sell it, that will be still adaptable. And we're going to make a new one using this pattern to adapt to that pattern. In order to do that, we need to figure out thicknesses. When I put this up to here, you can see that it bottoms out right there. Now it's possible that we can machine that, but ultimately what we wanna do is we wanna have that spline end up at the proper offset distance from this flange so that it goes in far enough on the engine to engage this thing. And in the previous iteration, this thing is shimmed out here and also these shims here in order to get it back far enough to engage those splines. I would rather not have that many shims if possible. So we want to have this spline stick out as far as possible in order to engage that so that that thing doesn't have to be shimmed out this direction. What that means is we'll probably have to machine this little lip out in order to clear this knob here. Today I had my good friend Mike over. He's a really good machinist and he's done this kind of thing before. So what we had to do is find a way to measure this whole pattern relative to this center line so that we could make the adapter that slides over these bolts and bolts in place. And then over the top of that will go this bell housing, which also has to be centered in order for everything to line up with the engine. We have our piece of billet aluminum or aluminium as they say it in across the pond. So we have everything we need and figured out how they set these holes up. We were able to get a dimension from here to here because we know that's the straight across line, pick up hole centers. We also know the top one is 90 degrees to that. We used some basic geometry and figured out that these were even increments of 30 degrees because we have 360 divided by 12. If you imagine a clock, you know, we've got those subdivisions. Of course, some holes don't need to be drilled because there are no pins in those places, no studs. Then we took the bell housing and did the same thing. We found our hole center by just taking a straight edge and measuring across at the widest point. We squared it up relative to these holes with another scale or a small measuring tool and double checked our work and we found out that the engineer that laid these out was using fractions so things sort of rounded to the nearest 16th or 32nd inch depending on where we we're measuring and we found out that these are also symmetrical about a center line here so we found out all of that relative to this hole and we made a separate sheet that I'll show in the pictures that lays out all of the XY coordinates for both set of holes that would be applied to this piece of aluminum. So here's the hole layout in XY coordinates. We're gonna use my friend's milling machine with the digital readout so we can find each of these locations relative to that center point. Then it's simply a matter of moving the XY coordinates on the table till we get those center points and drilling the appropriate size hole. Stay tuned in part three, and I'll show you how we actually do this in the machine shop. I always appreciate your support, so hit like and subscribe, and you'll get the future updates.